Good evening. Good evening to all and a warm welcome to yet another biography event. I hope that by now most of you or all of you have been vaccinated and that all of us are still staying, staying safe and wearing masks where appropriate. And of course, reading 800 page biographies. My name is Kai Bird and I am the director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography, a wholly unique institution hosted by the Graduate Center of the City University of New York and founded by Shelby White and the Leon Levy Foundation in the year 2007. I wanna thank Shelby for her steadfast support to the Biography Center. It is her vision that makes this program possible. Please note that our next event will be on July 8th at 6 p.m. when our very own Thad Zilkowski, our associate director, will talk about his new book, The Drop, a memoir about surfing and addiction. He will be in conversation with Diane Cardwell and Michael Scott Moore. Please mark your calendars and register for this free event on the Leon Levy website and pass on the information to your friends. But tonight we are here to celebrate my own new book, The Outlier, The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter. I started working on this biography six years ago and I have to confess that if the pandemic hadn't put us all into quarantine, I'd probably still be working on it. Anyway, I'm delighted that we are able to persuade the great journalist and author Sam Roberts to interrogate me about Jimmy Carter. A Brooklyn native, Sam Roberts has covered urban affairs for the New York Times and the New York Daily News for more than 50 years as a reporter, columnist, and editor. He is currently an obituary writer for the Times and he hosted the New York Times Close Up, the televised public affairs program since it originated in 1992 on New York One News and in its latest incarnation on CUNY TV. He has authored or co-authored or edited 11 books, including The Brother, The Untold Story of the Rosenberg Adam Spy Case, A History of New York and 101 Objects, who We Are Now, The Changing Face of America in the 21st Century, and most recently, Grand Central, How a Train Station Transformed America. He is just a wonderful journalist and biographer. Please look for The Outlier and these other books at bookshops.org, a site that will lead you to your local independent bookstore. Sam and I will now be in conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we will take questions from our virtual audience. Please click on the question box below to type in your questions. Uh, the chat box, you'll see it. Yeah. And Sam will be sure to get to as many as he can. Uh, we will try to end this program after about one hour. And again, thanks to the Leon Levy Foundation <coughs> for funding this and all our other events. And now, Sam Roberts, I submit myself to your interrogation. <laughs> Thank you, Kai. And let me tell you a little bit about Kai because he's too modest to talk about himself. Uh, he is the author of a wonderful memoir, Crossing Mandelbaum Gate, Coming of Age Between the Arabs and Israelis. And of course, the Pulitzer Prize winning biography, American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer and biographies of John McCloy and McGeorge Bundy and uh, The Good Spy, The Life and Death of Robert Ames. And uh, Kai, you said you first began thinking of this book in 1990. Uh, you got to sign a contract uh, just a couple of weeks uh, before Carter was diagnosed with what could have been a fatal disease. Uh, and it's fascinating to think that Jimmy Carter will be 97 next fall. Here's a guy who was born when Calvin Coolidge was the president of the United States. And with all the other biographies you did, why Jimmy Carter? Why did he seem like such a compelling subject? Well, you're right. I, I first got interested in Carter in 1990. Uh, I had just finished my biography, my first biography of John J. McCloy, the Wall Street lawyer. And in that book, I'd had to write a long chapter about the Iran hostage crisis. And it inevitably made, you know, compelled me to write about Jimmy Carter. 
because he was the president during the, the hostage crisis. And it's a great colorful story. And it made me think, well, this guy is a president I don't really understand. When I was a young man in my 20s as an assistant editor at The Nation, Jimmy Carter was president in the late 70s. And I thought he wasn't liberal enough. Um, like a lot of nation people, I think. <laughs> uh, and, and yet here he was in his ex-presidency doing a lot of interesting things with the Carter Center. So I uh, told my, my mentor, uh, Victor Navasky, that I was thinking of doing Carter as a president, a presidential biography. And he said, well, the way to organize, the, to explore this idea is to go down to Atlanta and do a magazine article for me on what Jimmy Carter's doing with his ex-presidency. So I did that and I came away after two weeks, I wrote the piece, it was a nice cover story about all the fabulous things he was doing. And but I'm sure I, Victor paid you an enormous amount. He paid me all of, I think, $175 or, <laughs> but uh, I came away from that experience thinking that it was too early and perhaps I was the wrong person to do Jimmy Carter. I didn't understand the South. I didn't understand race. I didn't understand uh, Southern Baptists. Uh, and it made me think, you know, maybe I should wait. And I went on to do other things. But I was always curious about Carter. He seemed to be an enigma. I didn't know what made him tick. And finally, in 2015, several books later, I came back to the subject. And you're right, Sam, uh, right after I persuaded Crown to sign me up to do the book, Carter had this amazing press conference where he calmly walked in and announced that he had brain cancer and was probably dying within weeks, if not months. And uh, I thought, well, I'll probably never get a chance to interview him, but <laughs> I did. He survived, he's cancer free, he's 96 now. He, he's still quite lively and, and his mind is all there. Uh, he's slowing down, but he's still an intimidating personality. Let me point out that today is the publication date of the book, and there were some reviews that came in. Timothy Naftali in the New York Times book review called this a landmark presidential biography. Publishers Weekly said the result is a lucid, penetrating portrait that should spur reconsideration of Carter's much maligned presidency. Uh, Kai, you said that uh, because you didn't understand the South back then, uh, you approached this like a foreign correspondent. What did you mean? What did you do differently that way? Well, if I had had my druthers, I would have moved down to Plains, Georgia and spent two or three years trying to figure out the, the culture and the history of South Georgia, where he came from. But I couldn't persuade my wife to do that. <laughs> <laughs> she was unwilling to live in Plains, which is still a population of about 650 people. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I did what biographers do. I dug into the archives and spent, you know, a total of probably five solid months in the presidential library going box by box, folder by folder, copying. These days, instead of using a Xerox machine, I use an iPhone to take pictures. And I, I think I copied 20,000 pages of archival documents onto my iPhone. And I interviewed uh, scores of people, including Carter, and really dug into it. And I have to say, Carter was a difficult interview. He uh, wasn't, he, you know, he was polite and uh, trying to be helpful, but he wasn't very much interested in the project because his focus these days is on the Carter Center and wiping out guinea worm disease and bringing peace to Syria and things like that. And looking back to his presidency is sort of the last thing on his agenda. But in my very first interview, I have to say, I was fortunate enough to ask him one pertinent question. I asked him, where are the papers of Charlie Kerbo, your personal lawyer? Because I don't see them in the archive. And his eyes, his bright blue eyes lit up 
And he says, well, that's curious. Charlie wrote me all the time, memos and letters. And, you know, he was my, my closest friend in, from 1962 on when, he, when Carter ran for the state Senate in Georgia. And uh, so he turned to his aide and said, we have to investigate this. And indeed, three days later, I got a phone call and they had found five boxes of the Charlie Kerbo papers in the attic of his uh, widow's house. And uh, about six months later, I was allowed to have free access to everything in those five boxes. And it was a rich source of material, memos and letters from Kerbo, who was sort of, uh, you know, he was a South Georgia law lawyer who was described to me as the Atticus Finch of the Carter administration, <laughs> you know, uh, and, just gave Carter all the political advice. And so it was a, a window into Carter's own mind. Well, that gives me a segue into something that really fascinates me about biography, process. Uh, what happens to future biographers when people don't write anything down anymore? You had great access to the Carter diaries, not all of them, I think, uh, you know, the minority of them, in fact. But what happens when people write things down digitally, when Donald Trump crumples up papers and throws them in the garbage? Uh, you said the diary was the greatest gift that uh, he could give, that Carter could give a biographer. Uh, how, do, how are biographers of the future going to deal with the fact that so much is digital, so much isn't written down, uh, so many things that you had access to, all those diaries that you quote, uh, Kerbo's papers, Carter's diaries, are just not going to be available. No, no, it's a tragedy. It's a real problem. Um, you know, I hope that people like you, Sam, and, and other working journalists uh, keep a record of their emails, maybe print them out, because that's the only way to really preserve them in a uh, you know, we're talking about 100 years from now, the whole platform, the technology will change. No, I don't know what's going to happen. It's going to be uh, very difficult for a biographer to do what I did. I mean, I not only had access to about 20% of Carter's presidential diary, uh, he, the rest of it, 80% is still closed. Um, unfortunately, I asked for permission, but he was reluctant to open all that stuff up because of privacy concerns and the fact that it had not gone through a, a declassification review. But I also got access to the diary of uh, several of his, car, uh, of his aides in the White House. Landon Butler very generously gave me a, a access to his diary. And uh, it, it, again, you know, allowed me to sort of be a fly on the wall to, to explain the mood and the emotions of, of the frustrations of these young 30, 30 something aides who are trying, working so hard to satisfy Carter. Um, it, it was uh, invaluable. And I don't know how I would have written the book without this material. So it's a major problem, you're right. I always thought it was a little bit self-indulgent, but why do people keep diaries? <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's, it's, I think, the same reason that you and I write. We are trying- and That's self-indulgent, you're right. We're trying to understand the world around us. And a diary is actually a very good way to sort of have a little moment of self-reflection at the end of a, a, a busy and confusing day. And you can see this in Carter's diary, which is just fabulous. He, you know, he would dictate it at the end of each day, almost religiously. And his, he would hand the cassette tape to his secretary who would transcribe it the next morning. And then he would tape over the cassette tape again. So there's no audio. I think he was worried about Richard Nixon and the Watergate tapes. He didn't want to have an audio version. Um, but his diary is very detailed and self-reflective and critical and gossipy. And he, it's a, it, at times it's clear he's using it to vent 
his frustrations with Congress, with his political opponents, with his foreign adversaries. And so it's very rich for the biographer. You quote Jim Wooten of the Times describing Carter as a quicksilver bubble, a living, breathing, grinning paradox, maddening for those who tried to define him. Uh, and then you say the defining mystery of Carter was his childhood, how he nevertheless was molded into something quite alien from his South Georgian racist culture. Well, what, what's behind that mystery? How was he molded? Yeah, that was the, the real mystery about how, how could a, a Southern white boy raised in a tiny hamlet in South Georgia uh, in the 1920s and 30s uh, with a father who believed in white supremacy, who believed in segregation, how did he escape from that? How did he come out as a young man going to the Naval Academy already uh, willing to treat African Americans as equals? And the mystery I think is, is solved in part by knowing a little bit about his mother, Miss Lillian, the very colorful talkative Miss Lillian. Some of us know from her appearances on Johnny Carson and some of the other talk shows where she, she had, was famous for her one-liners. But Miss Lillian was a Southern eccentric woman. And there is room in Southern culture for that tradition. The women in particular could be a little off, offbeat, a little off territory. And she was tolerated. Everyone knew in Plains that she had a different attitude about African-Americans and that she would attend church, but sometimes not. And uh, she would smoke, uh, drink her bourbon late at night. And uh, she would allow young Jimmy Carter to play with his African-American neighbors who were his only child mates. So this is a young boy who is completely comfortable in African-American culture. He could talk like them. He could, he, em, he empathized with them. Uh, and he, as a teenager, he became profoundly uncomfortable, I think, with his knowledge of the racial divide of the segregated society. And it, it, it rankled him. Um, so this is the source of Jimmy Carter's social liberalism. And it's, it's very profound. The book is called The Outlier. What, what's the difference between an outlier and an outsider? Oh, well, that's a good question. <laughs> Maybe there isn't any. Uh, I, I think there is. An outsider sim is, is simply describes someone who is outside, outside the circle. An outlier is someone, in my mind, that implies something more. He, he is consciously choosing a different path uh, and a path that is filled with, you know, it, because it's a conscious decision, it, it's filled with intelligence and it's well informed. And this is Jimmy Carter. He is a guy who I think he, I argue he, without a doubt, is the hardest working president we've had in the 20th century, and probably the most intelligent uh, and well-read. And he knew he, in any setting, he was probably the smartest guy in the room. And so he wasn't afraid to take sort of outlier positions if he thought that was, was the right thing to do. So uh, the word I like with short, punchy titles, and I think this captures him. He was also the most sanctimonious guy in the room. <laughs> Without a doubt. And that could There's be a great quote point. you have from Lester Maddox saying, the reason he says he never lies is because he thinks the truth originates with him. A absolutely. Uh, that, <laughs> that's a fair, critics on, a fair, fair cr criticism, unfortunately, from Mr. Maddox. Also, uh, you quote uh, Walter Mondale as saying, Carter thought all politics was sinful. Can you be a president thinking that all politics is sinful? Well, <clears throat> maybe not because after all, he didn't get reelected. 
But this is the, the other paradox about Jimmy Carter. Uh, you know, he, after all, he did come from nowhere to win the White House. And he was relentless. And he knew exactly what was necessary politically to do to win those primaries to defeat uh, Mo Udall and the other challenge, more liberal challengers as such in, in the Democratic primaries in 1976. And he was ruthless. The gonzo journalist Hunter Thompson, uh, you know, famously met him in 1974 when he gave, when Carter gave the Law Day speech in, in Atlanta and uh, ripped into the legal profession and particularly Southern justice um, as practiced by Southern lawyers. And Thompson was just astounded by Carter. He, you know, woke up from his uh, uh, boozy tea <laughs> that he was imbibing in the middle of Carter's speech and began taping the speech. And he later said that Carter was the meanest politician he'd ever encountered. And what he meant was driven just absolutely focused. And uh, Carter, but the mystery is, coming back to your question, how could he be in the White House and regard politics as sinful? Well, I argue in the book that in the 60s, among many other books that he read, he, he read Reinhold Niebuhr. Uh, and it's odd that he would be influenced by a liberal Protestant theologian from the East Coast establishment as such, but he was very much attracted to Niebuhr's argument that uh, the world is a sinful place and that it needs to be mended and that people, politicians in particular and leaders and communities need to use their positions of power to do good but you need to achieve power to be able to do good. So this allowed Carter to uh, uh, meld his ambition with his religiosity. And he was very, you know, in a way ashamed of his political ambition. He knew as a Southern Baptist that the, the worst sin was pride. And he had a lot of pride in his, in his intelligence and his ambition. And uh, so Niebuhr allowed him to say, okay, you do what's necessary to win power. But once you have power, you have to turn your back on the political expediency and you have to learn to do the right thing. And that's exactly how he tried to govern in the White House. He was the most religious president, you say. So was that a religious rationalization on his part? Well, rationalization, no, because he really believed it. And, you know, people look at Carter's ex-presidency and say, oh, well, you know, he, he has, he, he's been a fabulous ex-president and he's done all these good humanitarian good works and Habitat for Humanity and, and all, but he was a failed presidency. Well, that's, that, that doesn't understand the man. The, 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 you know, he was, it, he was both a decent ex-president and he was actually a very decent president too. And he was guided and motivated by his, his religion. And uh, it, he was relentless in that. Uh, you point out a whole litany of accomplishments that I think lots of people, myself included, forgot. Uh, but then you say many of his proudest accomplishments were political losers, and therefore he sort of is looked upon as a failed president, a failed presidency, uh, in large part because he didn't get reelected. Why didn't, wasn't he able to capitalize on those accomplishments and why did he lose so badly? Well, first of all, that 1980 election was closer than people remember. It, the polls were actually within five percentage points up until two weeks, 10 days before. But the he only won, what, six states? He, uh, less. <laughs> but yeah, no, it was a landslide defeat. But up until the end, there, you know, he actually believed he had a fighting chance against Ronald Reagan. But to answer your question, he, 
he actually, when he got into office, he did what he thought was the right thing. He tackled the toughest issues and often alienated his own political constituency. So he uh, won the evangelical vote in 1976 by 75%, 80%. Uh, but he lost it by a landslide in 80. What had happened? He had alienated evangelical Christians by insisting on a separation of church and state and insisting that white academies in the South that were popping up so that evangelical Christians could send their kids to all white academies could not get tax exempt status as educational institutions and Bob Jones University and other similar religious institutions could not get tax exempt status. So this, this, was, this was something that really alienated uh, evangelical leaders who turned against him, Jerry Falwell and the moral majority, which was just getting started, uh, went out and campaigned hard against him. He did the same thing uh, with Jewish Americans who voted 72, 75% of them in 76 for Jimmy Carter. And he lost a majority of them. He only won about 45% in 1980. And this was despite the fact that he had done Camp David, he brought Anwar Sadat from Egypt and Menachem Begin of Israel uh, together in, and in those famous 13 days at Camp David and forged a peace settlement. But he then proceeded to try to hold Menachem Begin's feet to the fire over the question of a freeze on settlements in the West Bank. And this was regarded by Jewish American leaders as uh, an egregious act of pressure against Israel. And they began to sort of, there was a whispering campaign that Jimmy Carter, well, he'd done Camp David, but he was anti-Israeli. In fact, he was just fearful that Israel, by building settlements in the West Bank, was going to make a, a long-term permanent peace process impossible. And of course, we're living with those consequences today. Well, let so me ask you about, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so he lost the evangelical vote, he lost the Jewish vote, uh, he, he lost, uh, you know, the Teddy Kennedy wing of the, of the Democratic Party. Largely, Kennedy challenged him over the health care issue. And both men, Kennedy and Carter, had both campaigned uh, in support of national health insurance, a national health care system, a comprehensive universal health and health care law. But Carter, once he became president, realized that it was extremely expensive. And he, as a fiscal conservative, was worried about the growing federal budget. And so he went to Kennedy and said, let's compromise on a universal catastrophic health insurance system, a foot in the door for uh, uh, national health care. And down the road, and hopefully in my second term, we'll get to a, a universal health a single payer plan, which is what Kennedy wanted. Well, Kennedy refused to compromise. Carter refused to compromise. Carter thought that Kennedy was using this as an issue to challenge him for the nomination. And indeed, that's what happened. And he lost uh, you know, the support of a lot of the liberal wing of the party. And Kennedy challenged him, won a lot of primaries. But Carter, again, proving Hunter Thompson's argument about how ruthless and <laughs> and mean he could be. Carter ran a tough campaign and he defeated Ted Kennedy. Uh, but he was greatly weakened and that was one of the reasons he went into the general election with Ronald Reagan uh, in a weakened position. Let me ask you about Camp David a minute. Did Reagan lie to Carter about the settlements? Well, that's a very contentious issue. And uh, most historians who've looked at this have tried to argue that, well, there was a misunderstanding. Carter didn't actually pin it down. Uh, and Begin never would have agreed to a, a five-year freeze of the settlements. I argue based on the diaries and the memos and Carter's own belief and Carter's own, you know, this is a man who pays attention to details. 
he's the former engineer who famously, you know, uh, managed every every little detail and read 300 pages of memos every day in the White House and spent 12 hours a day working. He, he believed that he had gotten Menachem Begin to agree to a five-year settlement of all, uh, five-year freeze of all settlement activity in the West Bank. And there was a separate letter that said this and Begin at the last minute substituted a different letter. And this was after they had already scheduled the White House ceremony announcing the Camp David Accords. And Carter and Stu Eisenstadt and the other aides believed that they were going to get the letter. It never came. Carter believed that he had been deceived. And he told his aides that he thought that Begin had lied to him. And I think he had good reason to believe that he lied to him. And this explains his attitude in subsequent decades where he was so vociferous about warning uh, the Israelis that what they were doing with the settlements was digging a hole that was demographically going to threaten the, the Jewish nature of the Israeli state. And, uh, you know, he's been proven to be prescient in many ways to we look at what's happening today. Carter was also lied to about the condition of the Shah, uh, a lie that uh, may have precipitated the hostage crisis. Does this mean he was naive? Well, I wouldn't use the word naive, but he was very much aware of the dilemma that the Shah posed. After having been deposed in a revolution that Carter had no control over and replaced by a theocratic revolutionary regime led by the Ayatollah Khomeini, the Shah was in exile and Carter refused to provide him asylum in America, refused to let him have permission to visit America because he was aware, quite rightly, that this could provoke the revolutionary regime and the Iranian people to be even more anti-American and perhaps to threaten our embassy. This is, you know, one of his diary entries. He feared that if the Shah came, they would take over the embassy again. And uh, so he resisted, uh, far from being naive, he resisted a very concerted campaign by his national security advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, by Henry Kissinger, by David Rockefeller, by John J. McCloy. And this was uh, not a, a simple lobbying operation. This was a well-funded, concerted effort by Chase Manhattan Bank and Milbank Tweed, Hadley and McCloy, the law firm that represented Chase. They codenamed it Project Alpha, and they set up a schedule of how who should lobby which Carter administration officials uh, each week. And they just pestered the hell out of the president for six months. And then they gave him the information that the, car, that the Shah was ailing, was sick with cancer, and he needed treatment that could only be provided in New York City at Sloan Kettering. This was not true. But Carter finally gave in, probably with the, when he realized that Cy Vance, his Secretary of State, had, who had also resisted this pressure, also finally told Carter, oh, I think we have to do the humanitarian thing and give the Shah asylum. And that, of course, precipitated the hostage crisis that lasted 444 days. And that was really the final nail in the coffin for the Carter administration. And so when people read that and start to develop conspiracy theories uh, about who actually runs the government and the permanent government, and then they read what you write about Bill Casey and ending the hostage crisis. Does that scare you? It does scare me. And I do write about what Bill Casey uh, did. And uh, I did it with some trepidation because I don't, as an historian, I don't like conspiracy stories. Most of them are not true. <laughs> Most of them are fun, but not true, or interesting, but not true. But you know, some of them are true. There was a conspiracy to assassinate Lincoln. Uh, and uh, when it comes to William Casey, who was 
Reagan's national campaign uh, manager during the 1980 campaign. Uh, the allegation is that Bill Casey, who was a former OSS veteran who loved his time in, in, in running covert operations out of London during World War II, uh, Casey, the uh, allegation is that Casey left the United States in late July to attend a conference on the OSS in London, an academic conference, gave a paper, but that it gave him a long weekend, during which time he might have flown into Madrid, Spain, and met with a representative of the Ayatollah Khomeini to talk about the hostages, to basically assure them that his candidate, Ronald Reagan, would give them a better deal. And uh, this is very controversial. It was investigated by Congress in the October Surprise Task Force headed by Lee Hamilton. And uh, they couldn't come to, a, you know, they couldn't find any real hard evidence. It was a mixed bag about whether Casey actually went to Madrid, Spain. But I write in the outlier about a memo that was found uh, describing a cable from the Madrid embassy reporting that Bill Casey is in town for purposes unknown. And I think this is the smoking gun that proves that Casey actually did take the trip to Madrid, Spain, did talk to the Iranians, did interfere with US foreign policy, and probably prolonged the hostage crisis because he was worried about a you know, an October surprise, uh, a sudden release of the hostages in, in October, just before the election that would help Carter retain the White House. I don't uh, want to make unfair accusations, but wouldn't that be treasonous? Uh, some people might call this treasonous, yes. <laughs> but Bill Casey is long dead. He passed away of a brain tumor in 1987. And uh, and yet, you know, he was, as he lay dying, uh, the Iran-Contra scandal had exploded in the Reagan administration. And if the October, if what I'm saying is true, that he began these negotiations with the Iranians in July of 1980, this is the beginning of the Iran-Contra scandal. So it makes perfect sense. Fascinating too, that you report that uh... Brezhnev was senile when he invaded Afghanistan. So you look at all these little quirks of history. Uh, why do you think that uh, Jimmy Carter was ill-served by uh, Brzezinski? Yes, uh, you know, it's, I was just astounded when I went into the archives and I, I spent a lot of time with Brzezinski's papers. And Brzezinski was, uh, you know, an academic, uh, a Polish American of aristocratic background, his father was a diplomat, uh, who had spent his entire academic career writing about the Cold War and the dangers of the, the Soviet Union. He was hired as national security advisor and his memos to Carter, you can see in the archives, he's relentless in trying to push Carter to be more confrontational with the Russians to uh, be tough, to do something militaristic, uh, to uh, hem the Russians in. And he saw the world. He saw any third world conflict like Nicaragua or uh, Somalia or Iran. He saw it all through the prism of the Russian, Soviet Russian uh, Cold War conflict. And Carter resisted this. This is the, the surprising thing. He constantly rejected Brzezinski's advice. You can see this in his, in his memo, his uh, marginal comments on big Brzezinski's memos. Uh, and they're acerbic comments. They're kind of, you know, snide comments. Uh, and yet he tolerated Zbig and I asked him why. And he said, well, I always enjoyed arguing. I like being challenged by Zvig. He had a hundred ideas and he was very entertaining. But Carter's more often than not cited and agreed with Cy Vance's worldview and his policies, but he found Cy kind of boring and unimaginative and just not very much fun to hang out with. So the only reason I can figure out 
by why Carter tolerated Brzezinski was that he was entertained by him, even though he rejected his advice repeatedly until the very end after the Afghan, when the Russians invaded Afghanistan, he began to listen more to Brzezinski. And that's of course why Cy Vance resigned. Kai, you also pointed out another fascinating thing, which goes to show the role that personality plays in politics and public decision-making that Carter empathized with Brzezinski as a person of Polish heritage because he saw in Poles some of the same similarities as people from the American South like himself. That's right, yeah. Uh, and Zbigniew Brzezinski liked that analogy a lot. Uh, and there is some truth to it, you know, the, the Polish aristocracy, like the Southern aristocracy, well, they both knew defeat. They knew the, the cost of defeat, and they came from cultures of defeat. And so they had a realistic view of the world, a hard-nosed uh, understanding of real politic. And so Brzezinski liked to make that analogy with Carter and Carter was sort of amused by it. <laughs> Here was a guy who you point out, uh, few of his predecessors or successors could boast that they had not lied, that they had broken the law, not broken the law, they had not taken the country to war. So why was his presidency viewed as a failed presidency? Uh, well, you know, the easy answer is that he didn't win re-election. And he ushered, by not winning re-election, he ushered in a, 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 an era of, of decades of sort of conservative, neoconservative uh, political trends. And so that sort of cemented his position as a sort of tipping point towards a conservative era. Um, but, you know, it, when with the passage of time, it's quite extraordinary to sort of look actually at what Carter accomplished. He had control, democratic control of both the House and the Senate. And he passed a lot of legislation, you know, everything from deregulation of natural gas to deregulation of the airline industry that allowed middle-class Americans to fly for the first time in large numbers. He got through uh, seat belts and airbag regulations that saved 9,000 lives at least every year in America. Uh, and on foreign policy, he just, you know, the list is really quite astonishing. He passed the Panama Canal Treaty and negotiated the SALT II uh, arms control agreement. He normalized relations with China. He passed the first major immigration reform in several decades. He made human rights the center of American foreign policy in a, not only in a symbolic way, but in a way that uh, is, you know, cannot be ignored. He, you know, it couldn't be ignored even by his more conservative successors. And uh, so his, presidency, his presidency is actually quite consequential. Did he have a 10 year in some respects, Let, we'll put the killer rabbit episode aside, but when he <laughs> lusted in his heart and when he made his famous malaise speech without, as you point out, using the word malaise, uh, preaching to the American public, uh, were those things he regretted in retrospect? You know, he laughs at the killer rabbit story and mm -hmm. uh, there, part of the, you know, the reason that Carter was so perplexing to many Americans was that precisely the fact that he was a Southern man. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand the accent um, and he was- but Was part of it that they were Washington Georgetown snobs and yes, didn't want to understand it? <laughs> and Carter did nothing to sort of woo the, the Georgetown set. You know, he, he um, routinely turned down dinner invitations from Catherine Graham, the publisher of the Washington Post. And he just, you know, he wasn't the kind of guy who felt comfortable going to a Georgetown cocktail party. He thought that was a waste of time. And uh, 
so you know he then set himself up to sort of exacerbate his image as a southern georgia bumpkin and you know the political cartoonist had a field day making fun of his accent his looks his dress and his georgia boys hamilton jordan and jody powell who were you know sort of in your face southern white boys who were defiant against the the norms of the washington establishment and uh, so there was a little cultural dissonance and snobbery that was involved, but uh, you know, they're, they're, the book is just, uh, I'm, you know, I still laugh at some of the stories uh, I hear, you know, coming back to Charlie Kerbo, his lawyer, who refused to take a job in, in the White House because he said he couldn't afford it. Well, he was a very wealthy <laughs> Atlanta, powerful Atlanta lawyer, and he probably could have afforded it, but he, he didn't like the idea of moving to Washington. He stayed in Atlanta and would fly up every two weeks. And, uh, you know, when Carter was campaigning for the White House uh, and he heard that Jimmy Carter had made part of his stump speech, I will never lie to you, he told Jimmy, well, there goes the liar vote. <laughs> Yeah. I'll, I'll bet Carter wished that Bert Lance hadn't taken a job in the administration. That's true. You know, Lance should have been given an, an appointment in the White House that was not that didn't require Senate confirmation. And, uh, but, you know, even despite that, he, you know, looking back on the quote, Bert Lance scandal, it was kind of a, a Mohill compared to the scandals we had in the Reagan administration or the Clinton or even the Bush administration. It, it, it was a tiny thing and he was actually never convicted. Uh, okay. Likewise, Hamilton Jordan was, went through the, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, an investigation triggered by one Roy Cohen. <laughs> uh, so, there, there are many colorful stories associated with the Carter presidency and uh, Carter does laugh at the killer rabbit thing, which was uh, hilarious. I write about it. I think I got the full story, <laughs> <laughs> but there was a rabbit that a uh, swamp rabbit that uh, swam up towards his rowboat as he was fishing in, in a pond near his farm in, in Plains and he gently used his oar to tap the water to shoo the, the swamp rabbit away. But Jody Powell was the one who blew up the story, sort of embellishing it as a rabbit that attacked the president. <laughs> and you know, the press had a lot of fun with that story. Speaking of Roy Cohn, we have a question from, uh, I believe, Judy Herbert. Uh, the president, ex-president, did a lot of monitoring of elections in other countries around the world when he left office. Did he say anything at all about the 2020 election here and whether he thought that uh, President Trump went absolutely overboard in saying it was an unfair election? Oh yeah, Carter has released a statement saying that the election was fair um, and, and uh, you know, he's, he's actually quite, happy with the election of Biden, who was an old political ally, the first senator to endorse him for president in 76. Um, and he was very unhappy with Trump, but he's, he's had a long history of going back, oh, several decades now about complaining about the nature of American election laws and the campaign finances. He was very unhappy with the Citizens United decision uh, and he thinks that money has taken over elections and he's even questioned whether America is, you know, on the road to no longer becoming a, a certifiable democracy because not enough people are voting and money is controlling the process to a degree that makes it undemocratic. Uh, you quote Tony Lewis as saying that uh, Carter rechanneled an authentic modern voice of that old American strain, populism. How does that populism differ from the populism people feared in the last election? Right. 
No, there there is right wing populism and left wing populism, and Jimmy Carter was certainly a populist in a southern tradition of progressive populism. He, uh, you know, he came from a, this small town, as we all know, Plains, Georgia, but he was actually quite privileged in his growing. He, he his father, you know, owned several thousand acres of farmland. Uh, the Carters were probably among the richest uh, residents of Plains. Um, and, uh, you know, by the time Carter ran for president, his peanut warehouse operation was really a small agricultural business, not just a peanut farm. It, and it was worth several million dollars. And uh, yet he had a small businessman's notion or uh, sort of prejudice against corporate America. And he had a suspicion of uh, wealthy Americans and wealthy corporations getting tax breaks. He tried very hard as president to, re to introduce tax reform and failed. And he, his diary is filled with acerbic comments about this, about the opposition he encountered from liberal congressmen who, who scuttled his efforts at real tax reform. So he was a populist, but he uh, he also was a fiscal conservative. Uh, you know, he had a suspicion of deficit funding. He wasn't really he didn't understand Keynes. He uh, he really was deathly afraid of federal deficit deficits. And in an era of in the 1970s when the country was struggling with stagflation. He was very concerned about inflation, and he thought that there was a relationship between federal deficit spending and inflation. Uh, so he he was a populist, but he was concerned about good government and zero base budgeting, and so this made him this was perplexing to standard sort of East Coast liberals who <laughs> didn't understand why he was so opposed to pork barrel spending. We also have a question from Suzanne Charlet, who says that uh, she was working at the Times at the time, and people thought Carter was a country bumpkin. Uh, having gone to the school in the South, she recognized uh, that was something typical of Northerners. She asked them to read the text of the speeches, and they found uh, the arguments were succinct, uh, the sentences were complete. Uh, almost to the point where you could hear the colons and semicolons. So in fact, he was much more literate and this was a prejudice against Southerners on the part of Northerners. Right. Did you find that to be true? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I, I as a Northerner, I had to struggle with this bias myself. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Carter, since leaving the presidency, has written 33 books. Now, some of them are books about fly fishing and uh, a book of poetry and uh, a book about his faith. And, and yet some of them are very serious, well-written books. His childhood memoir, An Hour Before Daylight, is just lyrical. It's really well-written and evocative. And it was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. This is a guy who knows how to write. He's well-read. He loves poetry. He writes poetry himself. And uh, he, as I said, I think he's probably the most intelligent president we had in the 20th century. The outlier is subtitled The Unfinished Presidency of Jimmy Carter. By now, almost 97, has he finished it? <laughs> well, I would say he would argue no, that his work is undone, that, uh, you know, he sort of views the Carter Center as an extension of his presidency. He's trying to still bring peace to the Middle East and solve the Sil Syrian civil war. And he still is uh, uh, really concerned about Israeli-Palestinian peace. And these and, and, and also healthcare issues in the third world in Africa, guinea worm disease and other diseases. Uh, these are all issues that he was concerned about when he was president. And uh, I think he regrets 
uh, that he wasn't reelected because he, think he, he thinks he could have gotten a lot more done during a second term. And I think in retrospect, I like the subtitle because it also explains not only his attitude about what happened in his first term, but it explains his, the rest of his life too, which was sort of an unfinished presidency where he's carrying out his, his good works. Andrea Couture asks, how influential was Rosalind Carter? Oh, Rosie, as he called her, uh, was very influential. She, uh, early in the administration, you know, pestered him so much about what was going on that he said, well, why don't you, you know, sit in on the cabinet meetings? And so she did. And she would sit quietly. She wouldn't say anything, but she would sit in the back of the room on a chair, not at the table and listen. And then they made a regular uh, habit of having lunch together on Tuesday afternoons where she could pepper Jimmy with questions and uh, also bring her agenda, you know, telling him, I think you should do X or Y. It's also true that, uh, you know, while Carter had this very strong aversion to doing anything that was politically expedient. You know, he, he constantly, when aides tried to tell him, well, you should do X because it, it, it will help us politically, he said, don't talk to me about the politics. I'll handle that. Tell me what should be done. Well, Rosie had a, a quite different view. She wanted Carter to think about his reelection, and she didn't want him to go out of his way to uh, alienate various parts of his own political constituency. And so she was constantly badgering him to do the politically expedient thing. <laughs> and she, her judgment was actually quite on the mark. She was very astute. And this is a woman you know, who never finished college, who uh, had a deathly fear in the beginning when he first went into politics of ever standing up and giving a speech. Uh, it made her nauseous. Uh, well, she became a quite eloquent speaker, and he, he would send her on, you know, meet the press or some of these big television shows, and she could be quite articulate and impressive. How does a biographer measure greatness in his subject? Ah, uh, well, that's an elusive term. I'm not quite sure how you define it. Uh, I guess in the in the case of Carter, uh, I you know, I, I disagree with some of what he did and his pol political instincts, but I admire his willingness to take on major challenges. You know, he was willing to tackle the Panama Canal Treaty when everyone told him that this was not domestically just a political loser, and indeed. He lobbied and persuaded enough senators to get it ratified, but seven of them who voted for the treaty in the next election were defeated. Uh, and yet he thought it was the right thing to do because it would uh, avoid the necessity of intervening in a civil war in Panama or other civil disturbances if, if something wasn't done to resolve the sovereignty issue of the Panama Canal. Uh, he tackled the Middle East against everyone's advice. And, you know, you can criticize the Camp David Accords, uh, but, you know, they're still standing and Egypt is still in a cold peace with Israel. And uh, it is the first step and it still is the only standing treaty that it, it, it forms uh, a vehicle for the future if we're going to ever have a, a real resolution of this conflict. So he, he was willing to take on big topics and, and uh, I admire that. Let me ask you one last question, Kai. Have you heard from President Carter about the book? <laughs> well, no, but mm -hmm. it's a little early. I just sent him a signed autographed copy. Uh, and he's in planes. Uh, he still is, you know, 
his mind is still all there. And I hear Rosalind reads lots of books, particularly listens to audio books. So I think they'll get to it. Um, and I, I hope they'll enjoy parts of it. But I know as a biographer <laughs> that no living subject is entirely happy with uh, any book that is done about them. There's always, you know, biography is an art. It's not an objective uh, profession. It's highly subjective. And, you know, this is my story, my take on the Carter life and presidency and not his. And so of course he's gonna have uh, quibbles and maybe issues with some of it, but it's a, on the other hand, it's a very sympathetic and admiring biography. Just like biographers are not happy with every review, but speaking of which the reviews coming in, as I mentioned earlier, Timothy Naftali in the New York Times calls this book, out, The Outlier, a landmark presidential biography. And our thanks to Kai Bird, the executive director of the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. And to all of you, thanks for joining us at this virtual biography center forum. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Sam. <laughs>